Hey, my name's Luis Antonio Perez. I'm the lead producer of Quien Are We? I'm just one of many people who help make this podcast. Representation is something that's extremely important to me, especially as a Latino creator. It's part of our shared mission in creating this show. You can help our mission by just taking a moment to give Quien Are We a rating or review on whatever podcast app you use. It really makes a difference in helping people find the show and elevating las voces lindas de nuestra gente latina. Thank you for supporting us and celebrating Latinidad with Colorado Public Radio. I like to grind my own pepper because it's the one thing I'm a little bougie about. So you have whole peppercorns? Yeah, whole corn? peppercorns in the mocajeta, which I just cured. I'm very excited about it. Yay! My friend, Leah, loves making entomatadas. Do you make this often? Like, is this just like a science for you now? Um, it's one of the few recipes that I just like know by heart. If you're not familiar, entomatadas are like enchiladas, but instead of cheese, they're smothered in tomato sauce. Once the tortilla is been oiled, fried, whatever, mm-hmm. I put it in my casserole dish. And then I'll put it, uh, cheese inside the tortilla. And then on top of the cheese, I put just like a little s- few slices of serrano. And then I seal it oh. with a little bit of sauce, kind of like um, a wax seal on an envelope. <laughs> yeah. Kind of like that. I get a little um. bit of sauce, put it on the end, and roll them up. For some people, family recipes go back generations. Leah got her in tomatada recipe from her mom, who got it from her mother-in-law. My dad wanted my mom to learn how to make it so she could make it for him. Oh my god! Because he's a Mexican man. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it just it it makes me feel closer to my culture and my family and my parents, my people. Just it, it makes me feel closer to me. As we see with Leah and sometimes seeing ourselves, family recipes can play a big role in our adult lives by giving us comfort in flavors and comfort in our skin. But what if just having the recipe for our family's favorite comfort food isn't enough? Have you ever had the experience of trying to recreate your grandmother's or your mother's or father's recipe and you just can't get it right? On this special episode, we'll talk about everybody's favorite conversation starter, food. From Colorado Public Radio, this is Quien Are We? Exploring what it means to be Chicano or Latine or Pocho or however you identify and diving into the beautiful things that make us who we are. I'm May Ortega. When it comes to his identity, 27-year-old Brandon Vargas has an interesting term he uses to describe himself. So I sort of call myself the classic American mutt because my mom's side of the family is a half Native American and a half Spanish. My dad's side of the family is half Irish and half Mexican. With a background that's a mix of diverse cultures, Brandon says that sometimes people seem to have a hard time figuring out his ethnicity. And that means they often overlook his Latino heritage. And that is a huge part of his story. On the day-to-day, this isn't usually an issue. Brandon lives in a diverse neighborhood on the west side of Denver, dotted with Latino and Asian restaurants and a mix of people who represent lots of communities. But sometimes, sometimes, total strangers will make assumptions about him based solely on his appearance. And sometimes it's led to embarrassing and even painful interactions. Aesthetically, most people actually tend to think I look Asian, so Hmm. um, most people ask me about Asian heritage. And I'm like, I have no idea. (laughs) You might want to go talk to someone who is actually Asian. I worked at Benihana's and the Benihana's uniform is a gi, like you tie around yourself. Mm -hmm. And so when I was working there in high school, I was a server. 
and there is this um, lady behind the bar and she looks at me and she's like oh i'm so glad that you people are embracing your heritage and i was just like oh there's a lot to unpack in there i'm gonna leave <laughs> oh boy <laughs> yep i'm gonna dip out Yikes, y'all, what is that? Being rudely mislabeled so often leaves Brandon with complex questions on how to explore and express who he is and how to do that in a way that feels genuine to him. So when thinking about my own identity, there's always the questions of like, well, should I investigate? Should I embody this more? I'm already interpreted to be something so different than what I am yeah. what label would actually feel like it fits or feel like it's mine so mm-hmm. that's made me feel more pushed away from my own natural identity and heritage and that is where food comes in one of the places where Brandon can find something that is uniquely his is in the kitchen Cooking is one way he can explore the Latino heritage that people don't even realize is such an intrinsic part of his story, one that he wants to connect with more deeply. The cooking aspect really does make me feel more tied on a personal level. It's not performative. It's something I do. It's nothing really tied to anything else that anyone else does. It's private in my own kitchen. I get to eat it. I get to cook it. I get to smell it. And then eventually when they're good enough, I get to share them with other people. And if they're family recipes, I get to boast that they're from my family. You could say Brandon inherited this personal relationship with food and cooking from both sides of his family. When he was a kid, his dad taught him how to find his way around a kitchen. He would grow into prepping fruits and salads. Eventually, he learned knife techniques and how to cook full meals himself. And while his father instilled him with a passion for making meals, his mother's side introduced him to a very special dish that's been a real point of pride for generations. Ah, green chili, for sure. And that is today's star. Well, that and Brandon, obviously, made possible by his abuelita. (laughs) Uh, My grandmother's green chili was the accompaniment and staple of every holiday. It didn't matter if it was Easter, Thanksgiving, Christmas. It was the gravy for ham, turkey, uh, perfect side dish for mashed potatoes, everything alongside of being its own stand-up thing. It's a really nice, velvety, smooth, spicy green chili. And it's the thing that all of my family asked my grandma to make. If it's not at a holiday... We all ask where it is, Um, (laughs) but it's always been a familial staple. We should take a moment to explain which kind of green chile Brandon is talking about here. Lots of people are probably familiar with salsa verde. It's a runny hot sauce served in a small dish, often with like tortilla chips or on tacos is how I prefer it. But in Colorado and New Mexico, and really most of the Southwest, when folks hear green chile, they think of a thick pork green chile. It's a type of stew that usually smothers whatever food it's on, like chile relleno, burritos, and even all on its own with a side of flour tortillas. God, my mouth is watering just talking about it. I mean, really, the food underneath the chile is just a vehicle to get the green goodness in your mouth, if we're being honest. Then there's the chile we're talking about today. Brandon's grandmother's green chile is more like a gravy, something you'd use to top off your plate, especially a dish like huevos rancheros. That's what Brandon uses it on. It's such a simple and pure and lovely recipe that is just symbolic of childhood for me. I mean, it's soft, it's luxurious, it is... um, the mouthfeel that it has is so unique. And then the spice settles on the back of your tongue the more you eat of it. And it's a slow buildup. Mm. So it's just the mix of those two sensations. And then its taste, its taste isn't complicated. It's a pretty straightforward flavor. It's the green chilies. It's uh, a hint of pork and it's the salt. Yeah. It's the green chilies sit at the helm of the flavor profile of that dish. And it is so simple and so elegant. The peppers that make up the chile have a history all of their own in Colorado and New Mexico. 
The hot, sunny days and cool, dry nights in the region are ideal for cultivating these peppers. Pueblo green chiles or hatch green chiles, depending on the area. And they make the local cuisine that much more delicious. This recipe has been in Brandon's family for generations. His commitment to perfecting this dish is not only because it's delicious, though that doesn't hurt, <laughs> to learn how to cook his grandmother's velvety green chile would create a bridge between Brandon and his ancestors. And it would become a delicious, tangible part of what defines him as a person. Basically, it would create a connection that he sometimes feels he's missing. Yeah, I mean, it's hard because, you know, none of the younger generations of my family were taught how to speak Spanish. I don't speak Spanish when I go um, to the panderia to get snacks. They speak to me in Spanish because they assume I know. And it's um, there's all these different pieces that I feel like, oh, I'm actually missing that piece. But having that cultural thing is like, oh, I can make this green chili, though. I can make this mean family you know, Latino green chili that really does sing close to my culture heritage and makes me feel like I am also a part of um, just my core heritage. Yeah. If Brandon wants to become his family's newest green chili connoisseur, all he has to do is ask his mom or grandma, right? I mean, just go and ask him, just like my friend Leah did with her mom for the entomatadas. Well, as we all know, things are easier said than done. How did I know you got this recipe? Did you get it from your mom or from your grandma? From your My mom. mom. Okay. Mm -hmm. And how did she write it down for you anywhere? Uh, she texted me it. <laughs> um, so that <laughs> very modern. That was nice. Yeah. So she texted me it, and then from there I worked from there. But I've had to go back to her a couple of times, and every time I ask her about it, it's different than the original message she sent me. What? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so then there was actually like one holiday like before the pandemic where I was like, okay, well walk me through how you do it. Mm -hmm. And um, she walked me through and then that too was different than the message that she, she sent me. So I was like, okay, well, there are so many variables here. This was all intimidating to say the least, but Brandon was up for the challenge. He was not about to let some vague or conflicting advice get in the way of his mission to make the perfect green chile. After all, how hard could it be? There's like seven or eight ingredients total, so it should be fairly easy. There's uh, garlic, there's a fat, there's pork, green chilies, and salt and onion powder. So he had the recipe and he had the drive to make great green chile. And he got to work. The first time he tried, Brandon remembers roasting the chiles, skinning them, then cooking over a hot stove for hours to create batch number one. And upon taking his first bite... The first time I made it, it was chunky. Hmm. Uh, odd description. It wasn't uh, anywhere close. It was like a really light green because I put too much flour in it. Um, oh. <laughs> yeah, so it was... <laughs> Pretty bland. It, it still had some of the spice, but it wasn't that good. So he tried again. And again. And a few times after that. I, this, in my first eight batches, I think about half of those, I was like, I'm messing up the flour so, so bad. But Brandon is not a quitter. He pressed on and got better over time. Before long, he's made his 15th batch. But that damn flour. The flour part is always the part that still makes me the most nervous because if you put too much flour in the dish, uh, it makes it bland. It's hard to recover from that point. And so it's been, I think I messed up like three times in a row of like getting beyond the point of no return. And it's hard to, hard to describe. It's not as soft as hers. Mm. And you eat it anyway. Yeah. You eat it no matter what. Yeah, I fully commit. Oh, boy. <laughs> Do you have any kind of estimate of how many times you've tried to make it? It's between 20 and 30. I know that. Uh, mm. I think this probably makes my second going in a third year. So when is the when's the most recent time that you tried? Uh, I think probably about a month or so ago. Okay, and how did that go? It went better. I... Um, 
changed up the pork cuts that I was buying for it, um, made it more tender. I uh, spent a much more delicate hand on the flour these times around, so mm. it's a lot more balanced. Um, there's still something I'm missing in the salt levels. I still am missing something there. If Brandon sounds as cool as a Chile in November when he talks about all these failed attempts, don't let him fool you. Getting so close to his grandmother's recipe, but never actually nailing it, le pica hasta el alma. What are some of the ways that you taste your recipe compared to your grandma's? Like, what are some of the differences that you notice there? <sighs> Texture for sure. And texture is the first thing I always notice when I try anyone else's green chili in my family. Like my aunts, my mom's, um, mine. That's always the first thing that I measure is all the mouthfeel. If it doesn't feel like truly sublime velvet, you've messed up somewhere along the lines. And for mine, mine is thicker. So she has, she's got a secret in there somewhere. I don't know what it is, but I'm getting closer. I have yet to nail down the velvety piece. And so for Brandon, even though he has the recipe written down and most of the instructions and he's made it so far, the journey continues to reach his huela's level of velvety perfection. But this is not a story of failure. What kind of feedback mm -hmm. have you gotten from different people in your life who've tasted it? So the roommate really likes it. He actually has remarked multiple times one of his favorite green chili recipes he's had in Colorado. So I'm like, oh, that's awesome. But we also live together. So, you know, <laughs> kind of have to say that. Uh, but he really does enjoy it. He goes out of his way to eat it on multiple times and will always compliment it. Um, really does hit home for him. Mm. And then my um, partner doesn't really eat a whole lot of spicy food, but they also really appreciate the green chili recipe. And I will make like a huevos moncheros dish for it because I love huevos moncheros mm -hmm. for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I'll yes. eat it all day. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's, they've also really um, remarked on the. Kyla, what would you have to say about the chili? Oh my God, it's hot. I can't taste anything. They really enjoy it a lot more than other dishes that you may find. But I'd say it's, it's pretty up there. And I, I say that pridefully. I know I'm on Federal and Colfax, and there's a lot of green chili competitors you, in my general yeah, neighborhood. You are in it. You're in the thick of it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> To be clear, Brandon's green chile is good, it's, it's great, but it's not perfect by his standards. But he's confident it is one of the best in his neighborhood where green chile abounds. So that's saying a lot. But for him, this is not over. Definitely a work in progress. The relationship with it is that it's really a um, labor of love. And each time that I make it, I manage to get it just a little bit smoother. And now, as I'm getting closer and closer, uh, the smoother our relationship gets. That relationship, like any good relationship in our lives, benefits him in more ways than one. Brandon said he's a fan of several Denver artists who express their Latino or indigenous heritage through paintings and tapestries. Brandon is doing that too, just with a knife and some peppers. This recipe also helped fuse a bond to his family and his heritage in a way that didn't exist before. It's already become a point of pride in his life. The fact that it's a living recipe yeah. and finding all of those hidden pieces of it that recipes past are all insightful into why we make it the way we do, how we cook it. I get to make my own traditions involved with it. <laughs> but I would love to be able to move anywhere in the world and be able to cook this recipe and be able to proudly say that this is my grandmother's recipe that she used to make for us. Yeah. And I want that level of perfection because I want to give that same experience that I had at those uh, family events at those holidays where they could eat it and it would fit in perfectly. So after all his hard work in the kitchen, Brandon's got his family's green chile recipe, or his own version of it anyway. And when he makes this dish, he stands alongside the generations of his mom's family. Even if a stranger at Benihana might not see Brandon's pride in his heritage, he knows who he is. And he knows his green chile is the bomb, or at least that it will be one day. Brandon's journey to connect and find his identity through food isn't rare. As you listen to Brandon's story, maybe you thought about that one dish from your childhood that you've tried to recreate, whether you nailed it or not. 
don't even get me started on my mom's enchiladas, okay? When I try to connect to my family through our food, I've thought about the love and the pride that goes into the work we do in our kitchens. We're not just feeding ourselves and each other. We're underlining who we are and the pieces of us that are unique, that make us special. And if we never quite match our abuelita's recipe, maybe that just makes it that much more unique. I'm May Ortega. This episode was produced by Luis Antonio Perez and mixed by Pedro Lumbrano, who also made our theme music. You can find a list of everybody who helped to make this episode in the show notes. Quien Are We is a production of Colorado Public Radio. Hey there, I'm Anna Campbell. And I'm Andrew Villegas. We both work as editors on Kien Are We. We are just two of the many people who help make this show. And we want Kien Are We to be a place to hear stories of Latino joy. It's the kind of show we always wanted to hear in our podcast feeds. So our team here at Colorado Public Radio made that show for you. If you care about these kinds of stories, there's an easy thing you can do to help. Take a moment and tell two friends about the show. That's it. Tell a friend or two. Thanks for listening and for helping to spread the word about Gen Are We.